Hi, welcome to the Doctors in Training Pharmacology Review course. I'm Dr. Brian Jenkins, the President of Doctors in Training, and our goal here at Doctors in Training is to help you be the best medical professional you can possibly be. Whether you're studying to be a physician, a physician assistant, or nurse practitioner, we feel like this pharmacology course is the right course for you. So I hope you enjoy this lecture, and I know that it's going to help you learn more, save time, and be awesome. In this lecture, we'll be discussing drugs that affect cholinergic transmission. So we'll be talking about drugs that are agonists, direct agonists at the cholinergic receptor. We'll also be talking about drugs that increase levels of acetylcholine, so they're indirect agonists at the cholinergic receptor. So where do we find cholinergic neurons? I hope you've already viewed the lecture on the autonomic nervous system, because that gives you a good background on cholinergic transmission and uh, where we find some of these nerves. But in case you missed it, we'll do a quick review. So all of our autonomic preganglionic nerves are cholinergic. So the sympathetic innervation of the adrenal medulla is cholinergic. That's acetylcholine. The sympathetic ganglia use cholinergic transmission. And the parasympathetic ganglia also use cholinergic transmission. The postganglionic parasympathetic nerves are also cholinergic. A few postganglionic sympathetics, which are not pictured, including postganglionic sympathetics that innervate the sweat glands, are not adrenergic, as most of the sympathetic nervous system is, but rather are cholinergic. And we'll see how this is clinically relevant in just a moment. We'll also see that somatic motor neurons are cholinergic, and that the striated muscle has a nicotinic cholinergic receptor for acetylcholine. So what's the disease where you have antibodies that bind to the cholinergic receptors in the muscle and cause progressive muscle weakness as you use the muscle? That disease is called myasthenia gravis, and we'll see how some of these cholinergic drugs are used to diagnose and treat myasthenia later on. And then finally, it's not pictured, but there are also cholinergic nerves in the CNS, the central nervous system. So if you have loss of cholinergic transmission in the temporal lobes, that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. And we'll see how some of these cholinergic drugs are used in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Let's briefly review the autonomic nervous system and specifically the parasympathetic nervous system because most of our cholinergic nerves are causing parasympathetic effects. And we'll talk about how these affect the body. Remember that the main parasympathetic nerve in the body is the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. It, it innervates most of the organs between the clavicles and the pelvic crest. You also get some parasympathetic innervation from the pelvic splanchnic nerves. The, the sympathetic nervous system uh, is your fight or flight system. The parasympathetic system is your rest and digest system. And usually we'll see that these two forces balance one another or oppose one another. So in the heart, the sympathetic nervous system causes increased heart rate and increased myocardial contractility. Parasympathetic system is going to reduce heart rate and suppress myocardial contractility. In the eyes, Sympathetic innervation causes mydriasis, or dilation of the pupil. I always remember you're dilating the pupil, you're allowing more light in, so you can see whatever it is that you're fighting. The parasympathetic system causes the opposite. It causes meiosis, or constriction of the pupil. In the salivary glands, sympathetic innervation causes thick, viscous secretions. Parasympathetic innervation causes watery secretions. And we'll see this over and over again, that the parasympathetic system causes an increase in in secretion from whatever part of the body it's innervating. So it makes everything in the body leaky is a good way to remember that. In the smooth muscle of the bronchioles and the trachea, sympathetic innervation causes those smooth muscles to relax. You can allow more oxygen in. Parasympathetic system, you don't need as much oxygen when you're resting and digesting, so the parasympathetic system causes bronchoconstriction. In the bladder, sympathetic uh, innervation causes uh, the sphincter muscles to clamp down and it causes the bladder to uh, relax so you have less urination. Parasympathetic system, parasympathetic system is going to make you leaky so it's going to increase urination by allowing the sphincter to relax, allowing contraction of the bladder trigone and also the bladder detressor muscle. In the male GU system, uh, parasympath parasympathetic innervation is going to cause erection. That's the point and then Sympathetic innervation is going to cause ejaculation. That's the shoot. So you can remember point and shoot, P for parasympathetic and point or erection, S for sympathetic uh, 
and, and for shoot or uh, ejaculation. And then in the GI tract, um, sympathetic innervation is going to reduce digestion and parasympathetic innervation is going to increase GI mobility, increase GI blood flow, and increase digestion. This is really, really important stuff because the drugs we're talking about today, all these cholinergic drugs, are going to cause parasympathetic, system, uh, parasympathetic symptoms. Uh, remember that all those postganglionic parasympathetics are, are cholinergic, uh, and they're going to cause all of these effects on their target organs. So if you have a drug that's acting at the cholinergic receptors, uh, it's going to increase acetylcholine, um, or it's going to just agonize those receptors directly, uh, you're going to have these cholinergic symptoms. You're going to have salivation, increased GI motility or diarrhea, you're going to have urinary urgency, you may have excessive tearing. There's a great mnemonic to remember all these cholinergic effects, and that is dumbbells. That stands for diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bronchospasm, bradycardia, excitation of skeletal muscle, lacrimation, sweating, and salivation. Just remember, you get leaky everywhere. These are all excessive versions of the parasympathetic system that we've just been discussing. All but two. Now think for a minute, what two parts of that dumbbells mnemonic are not parasympathetic, parasympathetic effects? Well, one of them is excitation of skeletal muscle. Remember we said that uh, motor neuron transmission is also cholinergic. So you have cholinergic drugs may cause excitation of skeletal muscle because they're acting not on the parasympathetic system, but acting directly on uh, motor neuron transmission. And the other cholinergic effect that is not parasympathetic is sweating. Remember, we said that sweat glands receive sympathetic innervation, but it's cholinergic sympathetic innervation. So you increase cholinergic transmission, you increase sweating, even though that's not technically a parasympathetic effect. So file that dumbbells mnemonic away. It's very useful, very high yield. You'll see that again and again. What drugs are we talking about that cause all these cholinergic symptoms? Well, there are lots of drugs. Bethanicol, carbacol, methacholine, pilocarpine, neostigmine, peridostigmine, physostigmine, edrophonium, ecothiophate. Basically, all the drugs we're talking about today are going to cause cholinergic symptoms. And we'll talk about each of these drugs one at a time. So let's talk a little bit about how cholinergic transmission works. There are six steps to cholinergic neurotransmission. Synthesis, storage, release, binding of acetylcholine to a receptor, degradation of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, and recycling of choline. And let's look at each of these in some detail. So the first step is synthesis. First, choline is transported into the cytoplasm by a sodium co-transporter using the sodium gradient. Sodium is moving down its concentration gradient, and choline is brought into the cell at the same time. This is actually the rate-limiting step in the production of acetylcholine. And there's a drug called hemicholinium that inhibits this co-transporter molecule. So you have choline in the cell. You need to attach it to acetylcoenzyme A. Acetylcoenzyme A is a byproduct of the Krebs cycle and fatty acid oxidation. And that reaction, joining those two molecules together, is catalyzed by an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase. Choline acetyltransferase can be inhibited by a substance called basamicol. That's not terribly high yield, but it may be worth knowing. After acetylcholine is synthesized, it's packaged and stored in vesicles. The vesicles also contain ATP. ATP is probably a co-transmitter that may inhibit the release of acetylcholine or norepinephrine. Most autonomic neurons release the co-transmitters as well as their primary neurotransmitters. The next step is release of acetylcholine. So when the nerve fires, the, the depolarizing action potential is propagated down the axon toward the nerve terminal. And the depolarization opens a voltage-gated calcium channel, so calcium flows into the cell. When calcium enters the cell, it triggers exocytosis of whatever's in the vesicles. Calcium promotes fusion of the vesicles with the cell membrane, so the vesicle releases its contents. This is a principle of neurons all over the body. Calcium always triggers exocytosis. This release of acetylcholine into the synapse can be blocked by botulinum toxin, which is what causes botulism, and botulinum toxin is Botox. You can remember that botulinum toxin causes flaccid paralysis. Think of Botox uh, causing flaccid paralysis of the facial muscles. 
black widow spider venom stimulates release of acetylcholine. All the acetylcholine is dumped into the synaptic gap. Once acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft, it can do one of four things. It can do what it's intended to do, which is bind to its postsynaptic receptor. Second, it can bind to an autoreceptor on the presynaptic cell, which further regulates acetylcholine release. Third, it can simply diffuse away from the synaptic cleft. And the fourth potential fate of acetylcholine, it can be degraded by acetylcholine esterase, which cleaves acetylcholine into choline and acetate. That choline can be recycled and transported back into the cell by the sodium co-transporter. We'll discuss several drugs that inhibit acetylcholine esterase, drugs like neostigmine and organophosphate pesticides. When you inhibit acetylcholine esterase, the native acetylcholine stays around longer. So acetylcholine esterase inhibitors enhance cholinergic transmission and could lead to toxic buildup of acetylcholine. Now let's talk about the cholinergic receptors. There are two main types of acetylcholine receptors, muscarinic receptors and nicotinic receptors. Now both of these respond very well to acetylcholine. That's the natural neurotransmitter. But some of these receptors also respond well to a molecule called muscarine, which is a, a, a chemical found in some poisonous mushrooms. These receptors that respond to muscarine are called muscarinic receptors. Other cholinergic receptors respond very well to nicotine, so they're called nicotinic receptors. And uh, the nicotinic, nicotinic receptors have a low affinity for muscarine, and muscarinic re receptors have a low affinity for nicotine. So they're fairly specific. Now, acetylcholine is the same molecule, and it works on both receptors. It's the receptor that's different. So let's talk about where these receptors are found. The somatic motor nerves use nicotinic receptors. The postganglionic parasympathetics use muscarinic receptors, and that's the only muscarinic receptor on the entire chart. The, par the preganglionic sympathetics and the preganglionic parasympathetics are all working on nicotinic receptors. So all the ganglionic neurotransmission in the autonomic nervous system is nicotinic. There are a few muscarinic receptors in the autonomic ganglia, but for the most part, you should remember this as a nicotinic system. So first we're going to talk about the muscarinic receptors. There are five different subclasses of muscarinic receptors. We call them M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5, so that's easy to remember. We know a fair amount about where M1, 2, and 3 work and where they're located. We know less about M4 and M5. We know they're located in the central nervous system. We're not really sure if they have any peripheral function. M1 receptors are located primarily in the gastric parietal cells. M2 receptors are located in the heart and also in smooth muscle. M3 receptors are also uh, found in smooth muscle. They're found in the bladder. They're found in exocrine glands as well as endocrine glands. Now, how these receptors work is fairly important. Uh, it's a fairly high yield topic for uh, your boards and other tests, so you need to pay attention to this. Uh, muscarinic receptors are G protein linked receptors. We covered this. In the, uh, in the lecture on receptors and pharmacodynamics. We also covered it in the autonomic nervous system overview lecture. So you should really go back and review those if you're not familiar with it. We don't have time to dive into it again in too much detail here, but we'll talk about it briefly. Basically, a G-protein linked receptor uh, works in this way. Acetylcholine comes and binds to the receptor, which causes, that binding causes a conformational change uh, in the receptor shape and that change activates a G protein, which is another protein that's in the membrane, and when it's activated by the receptor, that G protein undergoes some conformational changes, and then it goes on and it can activate other enzymes, and that, those other enzymes produce what we call second messengers. The M1 and M3 muscarinic receptors are linked to a specific G protein class called GQ, which activates phospholipase C. Phospholipase C increases inositol triphosphate, which increases calcium in the cell. Phospholipase C also increases diacylglycerol, which activates protein kinase C. And if you watch that lecture on the autonomic nervous system, you, you may remember the mnemonic we use, QTSIs have one M&M. &M. QTSIs reminds you that this is the GQ, and it activates phospholipase C. C for phospholipase C, C for calcium, C for protein kinase C. And the M&M &M part of that mnemonic was M1 and M3. Now, if you didn't watch that lecture, 
I understand that mnemonic is totally confusing, so you should probably go back and watch that lecture. So remember, M1 and M3 muscarinic receptors are connected to uh, the GQ G protein. Now the M2 receptor is not is still a G protein linked receptor, but it's linked to a G protein that's called GI, and GI inhibits an enzyme called adenylylcyclase. I is for inhibit. Adenylocyclase is responsible for turning ATP into cyclic AMP, and that's going to activate protein kinase A. So you can remember adenylocyclase starts with A, and that is connected to protein kinase A. So if you inhibit adenylocyclase, you're going to reduce cyclic AMP, and you're going to decrease protein kinase A. Our mnemonic for this was the MAD2s. M as in MAD, M as in M2 muscarinic receptors. The M2 receptors on cardiac muscle stimulates G proteins that are linked to potassium channels in the heart. So these work a little bit differently, and that allows for an influx of potassium into the myocardial cells, and that slows down the heart rate and, slow, and decreases the force of contraction. So in the heart, the M2 receptors are a little bit different. They're still M2 receptors, but they're a little bit different than the, the M2 receptors we see in the smooth muscle. Next, let's talk about the nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors also bind acetylcholine, and they bind nicotine, as we talked about. They have a weak affinity for muscarine. There are only two types of nicotinic receptors. They're called NM, which is found in skeletal muscle, so M for muscle, and NN, the N is for neuron. So these are nicotinic receptors in nerves, whether it be the autonomic ganglia, the central nervous system, uh, the adrenal, uh, adrenal medulla. It's basically a big, overdeveloped, specialized uh, sympathetic ganglion, so uh, that is also an NN receptor. Nicotinic receptors do not use the G proteins. They are ion channels. They are ligand-gated ion channels, so when nicotine or acetylcholine binds to a nicotinic receptor, it's going to open up a channel that allows ions to flow through the cell membrane down their concentration gradient. These are fairly nonspecific channels. They can allow uh, sodium, potassium, calcium, any cation to cross the membrane. But mainly we're talking about allowing sodium into the cell to cause depolarization of the cell. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. <laughs> date tonight, so I'm getting my guns ready to impress my hot lady friend. If things go well, it, well, you know. I do, but I don't really care. Can you put that thing down and help me out here? Nah, I gotta focus. Pretend I'm not even here. So, go ahead as normal then. Got it. The side effects of cholinergic agents, dumbbells, diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bronchospasm, bradycardia, excitation of skeletal muscle, lacrimation, sweating, and salivation. Dumbbells! See? I told you you needed me. <laughs> Man, I'm gonna look good. You're a puppet, Sal. Puppets don't have muscles. Then how am I lifting this, smarty pants? Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis, one of the chief educators here at Doctors in Training. It's time for your quick review number one. Let's get started. Are the following actions produced by parasympathetic or sympathetic activation? First one is elevation of heart rate. Well, that's obvious, that's sympathetic. Meiosis, parasympathetic. Erection is parasympathetic. Remember your point and shoot memory tool. Thick, viscous secretions, that's going to be sympathetic. Bronchoconstriction is para, parasympathetic, and increased digestion, parasympathetic. Remember, parasympathetic is rest and digest. Next question. What degrades, what degrades acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft? Well, this is acetylcholinesterase. Next question. 
what G protein class do the following receptors stimulate? So this wasn't necessarily uh, expressly put into the lecture, but let's go over them. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, receptor a, uh, alpha 1, that's going to be a GQ G protein. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, alpha 2, that's going to be a GI protein. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, beta uh, 1 receptor is going to be a GS receptor. Epinephrine, norepinephrine on a beta 2 is going to be a GS, a G protein. Acetylcholine M1 is a GQ. Acetylcholine M2 is a GI. Acetylcholine M3 is a GQ. And dopamine is a, uh, with a D2 receptor is going to be a GI, G protein. Next. What is the rate limiting step in acetylcholine synthesis? Oh, well, this is going to be uptake of choline. Remember how uh, acetylcholine will get cut in half? Well, that choline remnants can be reabsorbed um, and then uh, refashioned into acetylcholine uh, in the cell. Next question. What enzyme catalyzes acetylcholine synthesis? Well, this is choline uh, acetyltransferase. Next question. What ion always triggers exocytosis? Uh, so remember, calcium is going to be that ion that always triggers exocytosis. Next question. What are the four potential fates of acetylcholine? So uh, this is in the uh, synaptic cleft. So you can bind to a postsynaptic receptor, so it's actually doing the job it's, it's supposed to do. It can bind to an autoreceptor on the presynaptic cell, so it takes a U-turn, and this further regulates um, acetylcholine release. So remember, it's sort of a self-regulating thing. Diffuse away from the synaptic cleft, so it just kind of floats off. And then degraded by acetylcholinesterase. Uh, and this cleaves acetylcholine into choline and acetate. And remember on a previous question, that choline can then be reabsorbed and then uh, resynthesized into acetylcholine. Next question. What is the only place you will find muscarinic acetylcholine receptors? Well, this is going to be postganglionic parasympathetic. So that's where you're, the only place you're going to find uh, muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Next question, what are the symptoms of excess parasympathetic uh, activity? And this uh, is excess uh, cholinergic activity. Dumbbells, so diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bronchospasm, bradycardia, uh, excitation of skeletal muscle, lacrimation, sweating, and salivation is the last one. All right, so that's going to do it for our quick review number one. Let's get back to the lecture. Next, let's talk about some specific drugs. And the first group of drugs we'll talk about are the direct agonists at cholinergic receptors. So these are drugs that mimic the effects of acetylcholine by binding to the acetylcholine receptor. Some of these are chemically similar to acetylcholine. They're uh, synthetic choline esters. So they're drugs like bethanicol, carbacol, methacholine. You can remember these. They all have coal in the name, so you can remember that they are cholinergic drugs. Some of these cholinergic agonists are naturally occurring alkaloids, um, such as pilocarpine. Now, muscarine, which we talked about, is also a naturally occurring alkaloid. Pilocarpine ends with ene, just like muscarine, so it's easy to remember that that's a little bit different chemically, and that's why it has a little bit different name. For the most part, all these drugs have a longer action on the cholinergic receptor than acetylcholine does. For the most part, they act on muscarinic receptors rather than nicotinic receptors. Um, so think about it. The target organ transmission of the parasympathetic system is all muscarinic. Uh, and so most of these drugs work on all these muscarinic receptors out in the target organs. For the most part, these direct agonists show little specificity in their action. So you're going to get a lot of side effects. You're not going to be able to target them to one tissue or another. You're going to get a lot of side effects, and that limits how clinically useful these drugs are. So the first chemical to talk about is acetylcholine. It's sort of the model or the prototype, but it's not really a drug we use very often. It has too many actions. It's inactivated very rapidly by acetylcholine esterase. Sometimes it's used in eye surgery. They instill it into the anterior portion of the eye, the anterior chamber, in order to cause meiosis. Um, but obviously it has both muscarinic and nicotinic activity. Pretty much the actions of acetylcholine are pretty much exactly what you'd expect from any drug that acts on all these parasympathetics. It's going to slow the heart rate. It's going to decrease cardiac output. It's going to lower the blood pressure. Uh, when you give 
intravenous acetylcholine, it binds to M3 receptors on the endothelium of smooth muscle uh, of the, uh, the vasculature. And that's going to increase nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. We don't know why there are M3 receptors in the endothelium inside blood vessels, because there shouldn't be any, any uh, acetylcholine in the blood vessels. It shouldn't be in the bloodstream. It should only be coming from nerves. But we know that these, these M3 receptors exist. Acetylcholine will also cause increased salivary secretion. It's going to cause increased intestinal secretion and increased GI motility. It's going to cause increased bronchiolar secretions. It's going to cause increased expulsion of urine. So again, it makes everything leaky. In the eye, acetylcholine causes contraction of the ciliary muscle uh, for near vision. So you're going to have uh, contraction of the ciliary muscle. And if you give acetylcholine, you might be, uh, be unable to uh, focus the eyes for a temporary amount of time. In the eye, it also caused constriction of the pupil or meiosis as we've discussed. The first drug that we're actually going to talk about that we use clinically is called bethanicol. It is structurally similar to acetylcholine. It's not inactivated by acetylcholine esterase, so that's useful, and so it's going to last a lot longer than acetylcholine will. It lasts about an hour in the body. It's inactivated by hydrolysis by other esterases. It has strong muscarinic activity, but basically no nicotinic activity. So bethanicol is only acting on the muscarinic receptors. Mostly it acts on the uh, muscarinic receptors in the smooth muscle of the bladder and the GI tract. So you can remember B for bethanicol, B for bowel and bladder. It's going to directly stimulate those muscarinic receptors and cause increased intestinal motility and increased intestinal tone. It's also going to cause uh, increased tone in the bladder detressor, so you're going to get increased urination. So we use this drug, we use bethanicol, to treat patients who have atony of the bladder or atony of the bowel, which we call an ileus, especially used for non-obstructive urinary retention, say someone who's had surgery and their bladder just hasn't woken up, as we say. Uh, we can give bethanicol and cause them to start urinating again. If they have an ileus or neurogenic gastrointestinal atony, you can stimulate the, the, the GI muscles to start working again. You can stimulate the bowels to start working. So very often patients will have a post-operative ileus where their, their bowels just aren't working yet. You can stimulate that if you need to with bethanicol. Sometimes we use bethanicol to treat anticholinergic side effects of other drugs. So we're going to talk about anticholinergic side effects in, a, in another lecture. That will be covered in the anticholinergic lecture or the lecture on cholinergic antagonists. But these side effects include what we call being hot as a hair, dry as a bone, red as a beet, blind as a bat, mad as a hatter, and bloated as a toad. So going down that same list, it causes increased body temperature, dry mouth, flushed skin, uh, paralysis of the ciliary muscles so you can't focus the eyes, disorientation or delirium is mad as a hatter, and then bloated as a toad represents constipation or urinary retention. So these are all side effects of drugs that have anticholinergic activity. The drugs we're talking about primarily, neuroleptics, which are antipsychotic drugs, such as haloperidol, and then tricyclic antidepressants, such as amitriptyline, nortriptyline. These very commonly cause um, anticholinergic side effects. So if a patient is having urinary retention, they're bloated as a toad, or they're having flushing or hyperthermia and dry mouth, they're having anticholinergic side effects, and you know that they happen to be on uh, one of these um, drugs that causes this, you might want to treat that with a little bethanicol to reverse some of those symptoms. Now, bethanicol does have some adverse effects. As I said, this is not a selective drug. It's going to act everywhere. So you're going to have generalized cholinergic effects. You can have sweating, salivation, uh, diarrhea, uh, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, all those dumbbell symptoms that we talked about. Our next drug is Carbacol. And remember, it's a call drug, so it's also a cholinergic drug. Unlike Bethanicol, it acts both at muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. Like Bethanicol, it is not inactivated by acetylcholinesterase, and it also lasts about an hour in the body. Uh, if you give it systemically, it can cause uh, effects of the GI system and the cardiovascular system. Uh, it can cause a release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla by its nicotinic action, so we don't usually give it systemically. It's going to raise the blood pressure, increase the heart rate, and so forth. Um, we do give it locally in the eye, 
And what would you expect it to do when given as an eye drop? It's going to cause meiosis. It's going to cause the pupil to constrict. So therapeutically, we use it to treat glaucoma. If you give carbocol eye drops, it's going to cause pupillary contraction and a decrease in intraocular pressure. The nice thing about carbocol, it has essentially no adverse effects. It's used at very small doses as an eye drop. It's not very well absorbed systemically, so it's not going to cause a lot of systemic side effects. The next drug is pilocarpine. Uh, as we mentioned, pilocarpine is a, a naturally occurring plant alkaloid, like muscarine. It is not hydrolyzed by acetylcholinesterase, and it exhibits muscarinic activity, as you might expect. It's less potent of a cholinergic agonist than, uh, than acetylcholine is, um, but it will cross the blood-brain barrier at therapeutic doses. So you can remember P for pilocarpine, P for penetrating the blood-brain barrier, if that's helpful to you. Pilocarpine is mainly used topically for glaucoma, especially in glaucomic emergencies. Uh, it's the drug of choice for glaucoma emergencies, both for open-angle glaucoma and closed-angle glaucoma. It causes contraction of the ciliary muscle, which opens up the trabecular meshwork and increases outflow of aqueous humor, so you get an immediate drop in intraocular pressure. And it can last up to eight hours, so that's a really good thing. And it can be repeated several times if needed. There are other drugs we use for chronic treatment of glaucoma, but for emergencies, pilocarpine is the drug of choice. Pilocarpine also causes what we call a spasm of accommodation, so it's impossible to focus the eyes. You get blurred vision when you give it. Pilocarpine also happens to be one of the most potent stimulators of secretions, including sweat and tears and saliva. Remember, parasympathetics make you leaky all over. So it's not very selective, and that limits its usefulness somewhat. Um, but think about it. Why would you want to make somebody sweat and drool and tear up all at once? You just don't have much call for that. Sometimes we use it to treat xerostomia, or dry mouth. Uh, if you have dry mouth from radiation therapy of the head and neck, uh, you can sometimes treat that with pilocarpine. You can also use topical pilocarpine in the mouth uh, for a condition called Sjogren's syndrome, which is an autoimmune destruction of the tear glands and the salivary glands, so they get dry eyes and dry mouth. Unfortunately, pilocarpine for this has to be used three or four times a day. There's another topical cholinergic agonist called Sevimiline, or Evazac, which is also used for Sjogren's syndrome. It's also pretty nonspecific, so it can cause adverse effects of sweating, nausea, rhinitis, and diarrhea. Pilocarpine also has a couple of important adverse effects worth knowing. As we said, pilocarpine penetrates the blood-brain barrier, and so it can enter the brain and it can cause some CNS disturbances. Uh, it can also stimulate profuse sweating and salivation even if you're giving it topically in the eye, so you need to be aware of that. The next drug to talk about is methacholine. Remember, methacholine has choline, so it's a cholinergic agonist. It's not used for the treatment of asthma, but it's used in the diagnosis of asthma. So what effect does cholinergic stimulation have on the bronchioles? It causes increased secretion, but more importantly, it causes bronchospasm, the bronchoconstriction. So we have a test called the methacholine challenge test. Basically, you do spirometry, you do pulmonary function tests of the patient at baseline, you see how well they're moving air, and then you give them inhaled or nebulized methacholine. And then you, do, you repeat the spirometry and see if they've had some bronchospasm, see if they're not moving air as well after methacholine as they were before. Now, anyone can have bronchospasm from methacholine if you give high enough doses. But even at low doses, someone with asthma can get a little bronchospasm. So we don't use methacholine to treat anything, but it is sometimes used for the diagnosis of asthma. You have to be careful, though, because you don't want to cause major asthmatic crisis or asthma attack by giving methacholine in your diagnostic testing. There are a couple of other cholinergic agonists worth talking about that are not mentioned in Lippincott's, at least not right here in this chapter. What other than acetylcholine acts at nicotinic receptors? Well, obviously, nicotine does, so we need to cover nicotine briefly. Nicotine is also covered in Chapter 10 on the CNS stimulants. Basically, nicotine is an agonist of nicotinic receptors. It acts on nicotinic receptors in the CNS, as well as skeletal muscle, and in the autonomic ganglia, including the adrenal medulla. Uh, it has more affinity for receptors in the CNS than it does in skeletal muscle. So most of the actions of nicotine are therefore central nervous system actions. It causes euphoria, arousal, alertness, and relaxation. So you feel pretty good when you smoke. Um, it also causes some appetite suppression. It can be highly, highly addictive, just as addictive as morphine or heroin. 
In the peripheral system, nicotine causes increases blood pressure and increase in heart rate because it's stimulating the sympathetic ganglia and the adrenal medulla. So you're going to have more downstream adrenergic uh, transmission. It also causes some vasoconstriction and decreased coronary blood flow. So that's very dangerous to patients who have angina or coronary disease. And at high doses, nicotine can actually cause ganglionic blockade rather than ganglionic stimulation. So do we ever use nicotine therapeutically? Well, yes. We give nicotine to patients who are trying to quit smoking. They're addicted to nicotine, and it's not good to keep giving nicotine, but a lot of the bad effects from smoking are due to all the other hundreds and hundreds of chemicals that are found in uh, cigarette smoke and tobacco smoke. So you're, you're going to continue giving them nicotine, which is what they're uh, addicted to, but you're taking away all those other bad chemicals that are doing other harm. So we can give nicotine as a patch. We can give nicotine as a gum. They even make some nicotine inhalers in various types. Another uh, nicotinic agonist is varenicline. The brand name is Chantix. And this is also more completely covered in that same chapter 10. It is a partial agonist of the nicotinic receptors. It causes less euphoria than nicotine does. So basically patients say, Varenicline doesn't make me feel as good. I smoke and I, I just don't get much buzz from it. Uh, it's therapeutically used as an aid to smoking cessation as well. Uh, the adverse effects of varenicline in, include nausea and headache and vivid nightmares. And there's some concern about depression and suicidal behavior. Uh, it's a little controversial, but you will hear about that. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. All right, we're back. It's time for quick review number two. Let's get started. What is the effect of giving acetylcholine by IV? Uh, remember, most of the time, acetylcholine naturally doesn't float around in the body. It usually stay, it stays in that synaptic cleft mostly. Uh, though it can diffuse out, diffuse out. Well, it binds to M3 receptors on the endothelium of smooth muscle of the vasculature. So it's affecting those, uh, that vasculature. It, it will also increase nitric oxide and cause vasodilation. Next question. What is the mechanism of action uh, for bethanicol? Well, it stimulates muscarinic receptors. It causes increased intestinal motility and tone and it stimulates uh, detrusor muscles of the bladder and relaxes the trigone and the sphincter. So ultimately, it leads to expulsion of urine. So when are we going to use our beth anacol? Well, if someone uh, has had anesthesia and they can't urinate, you might want to use it. Or if someone has um, uh, intestinal atony, if they're not able to, to move their bowels at all, occasionally we'll use it as well. Next. A 30-year-old male with schizophrenia now has urinary retention due to his neuroleptic medication. Uh, what drug could be given to treat his urinary retention? Well, we just talked about this drug. This is bethanicol. So why would a schizophrenic, schizophrenia patient uh, have problems with the neuroleptic medications? Well, many of the neuroleptic medications have a lot of anticholinergic activity. So it's, a, it's that anticholinergic activity that's causing all this. Next, why is carbo, uh, carbacol not usually given uh, systemically. Well, it has serious effects on the cardiovascular and GI symptoms. So it's going to raise blood pressure and it's going to increase your heart rate. But it'll also cause a release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla as well. Next, what is the mechanism of action for pilocarpine in the eye? Well, this produces rapid meiosis and contraction of the ciliary muscle, so it'll help in decreasing that ocular pressure. Next, methylcholine is used in the treatment of what diseases? Well, trick question, it's not used in any uh, actual diseases, but it's used for diagnostic purposes. So methylcholine um, is used only for the diagnosis of asthma. So if someone has asthma, even small amounts of uh, uh, methylcholine could induce bronchospasm, and that's how you get a better idea if they actually have asthma. Oh, you, know, you want to be careful not to give them too much and give them a, a full asthmatic attack. Next question. Describe the effects of nicotine on the CNS in relation to high and low doses. So at low doses, you get arousal and, and sort of relaxation, like you're smoking a cigarette and people kind of have that, oh, you know, I feel good and I'm a little more uh, uh, alert. 
high doses central respiratory paralysis, so quite a bit worse, uh, and severe hypotension by uh, medullary paralysis. So you don't want to smoke uh, 1,400 cigarettes. It's really hard to get nicotine poisoning by smoking. You have to smoke an incredible amount, and it's really pretty much impossible. Really, the only time you're going to get nicotine uh, poisoning is if you get liquid nicotine and spill a whole bunch of it on your, on your body because it gets absorbed uh, through the skin. Next question, what are some adverse effects of uh, uh, varenicline? So this is the anti-smoking drug. So nausea, headache, vivid nightmares, uh, and also suicidal behavior. You don't want to give this medication to your uncontrolled uh, depressed patients. Always let them know, even though you don't have a history of depression, if you really start feeling bad, it can be the medication, so stop it. The vivid nightmares is a big deal too. I find most of my patients will have some degree of vivid dreams. They're not always bad nightmares keeping them awake. Um, but they'll have some pretty uh, significant dreams. Next question, what is the pathogenesis of glaucoma? So uh, we talked about some glaucoma drugs, so let's talk a little bit about glaucoma. So <clears throat> glaucoma is uh, um, basically a buildup of aqueous humor. So uh, one way is through a blockade of the canal of Schlem. So canal of Schlem is sort of this safety valve that re uh, uh, will reabsorb some of that aqueous humor uh, and therefore you won't get an increase in pressure. So if you block that canal, aqueous humor is, is not reabsorbed and you get increased pressure. So why does this ultimately lead into something bad? Well, with that increased pressure, you can get atrophy of the optic nerve, and that's when you start losing vision. It can be a big, big deal. Next question, what is the difference between open angle and acute angle closure glaucoma? So uh, good to know the differences be between these two. Open angle glaucoma is the common version. It's the insidious form, almost always bilateral. Um, people can have it for quite a long time and not realize it can be asymptomatic. Um, and it's an obstructed outflow problem. So problem with the canal of Schlem. Remember, we just talked about how that reabsorbs that aqueous humor. Risk factors include uh, older than age 40, uh, black and uh, diabetes. Uh, early stages can be asymptomatic. So remember that, that you can be asymptomatic with uh, uh, open angle glaucoma. Late stages can get bad because you can get areas of reduced or absent vision, contraction of the visual field. Uh, in, it starts with peripheral and then goes to central vision loss. So different to that is the acute angle closure glaucoma. So this is more of an emergency. This is a, an obstruction of flow uh, between the iris and the lens. And this is abrupt onset of pain, nausea. You can get colored halos, rainbows around light. Uh, you get this red, teary eye, hazy cornea, fixed, mid-dilated pupil, not reactive to light, and it's firm uh, to palpation. So quite a bit of a, a different uh, scenario here. So if you see a really painful red eye, that is an emergency, uh, and you need to get an ophthalmologist on board uh, and, and get things going. What medication did we talk about uh, helping? Pilocarpine uh, can certainly help with, with any emergency uh, glaucoma problem. All right, so let's can conclude our quick review number two. Let's get back to the lecture. So let's switch gears and talk about the indirect cholinergic agonists. These are the reversible anticholinesterases. Sometimes we'll call these cholinesterase inhibitors or anticholinesterases. Personally, I don't like the idea of calling these indirect agonists because that's not technically correct. These are not agonizing the receptors. They're not acting on the receptors directly. They're causing increases in acetylcholine and allowing acetylcholine to stay around longer. They have no direct effect on the acetylcholine receptor. Acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that cleaves acetylcholine to acetate and choline. The enzyme is bound to the membrane of both pre- and postsynaptic nerve terminals. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors reduce the inactivation of acetylcholine, so acetylcholine stays around longer, so you get more cholinergic effect. These drugs inhibit acetylcholinesterase everywhere in the body, so you get increased acetylcholine everywhere, including the autonomic nervous system, the neuromuscular junctions, and in the central nervous system. Several of these drugs end in stigmine. Physostigmine, neostigmine, peridostigmine, but not all of them do. Some of them are, uh, have different names like edrophonium, demacarium. So the first drug to talk about is physostigmine. It is a natural alkaloid found in an African plant called the calabar bean plant. Uh, physostigmine is a substrate for acetylcholinesterase. It's going to bind to that same acetylcholinesterase enzyme, but it inactivates the enzyme when it binds to it. And it lasts for two to four hours. It can enter the central nervous system and increase cholinergic transmission in the CNS. We can use physostigmine in several ways. It increases intestinal and bladder motility. So just like the other cholinergic drugs, it's sometimes used for 
apnea of the, uh, the bladder or the bowel, just like bethanicol. Physostigmine can also be used in the eye. It lowers intraocular pressure and it can be used for glaucoma. It's less effective than pilocarpine, but you can remember physostigmine is for the eyes. It's effective for glaucoma. And we also use physostigmine to treat overdoses in drugs that cause anticholinergic actions that we talked about, drugs like atropine, drugs like the phenothiazines or those, uh, those neuroleptics we talked about, and also the tricyclic antidepressants. So sometimes you can remember uh, physostigmine fixes atropine overdose or fixes anticholinergic drug overdose. In terms of adverse effects, physostigmine does cross the blood-brain barrier, so it can cause seizures at high doses. It increases cholinergic neurotransmission, and, and therefore it's going to cause bradycardia and reduce cardiac output. At skeletal muscle neuromuscular junction, you can cause accumulation of acetylcholine, so you can actually get paralysis. But all of these side effects are pretty rare at therapeutic doses. The next drug is neostigmine. So physostigmine is a naturally occurring substance, but you can make a synthetic version and you get drugs like neostigmine and peridostigmine. Neostigmine is a more polar molecule than physostigmine, so it does not cross the blood-brain barrier. You can remember neostigmine starts with N and so does not crossing the blood-brain barrier. Uh, neostigmine has a shorter duration of action than physostigmine. It lasts only 30 minutes up to maybe one or two hours. And it has more effect on skeletal muscle than physostigmine does. So we're going to use it then for bladder atony and GI tract atony or ileus. You can also use it as an antidote to neuromuscular blockers. So if you're doing surgery on somebody and you need to anesthetize them, you need to paralyze them so they can't move around during surgery. So you give a neuromuscular blocker. You give a drug that's a competitive antagonist at the nicotinic receptors. Drugs like tubocurarine, vecuronium, rocuronium. We'll discuss these in the, in the next lecture on cholinergic antagonists. But when surgery is over, you're trying to wake the patient up, you've got to reverse that paralysis that you've induced. So you give neostigmine. It's going to reverse that neuromuscular blockade. Those, those neuromuscular blockers are all competitive antagonists, so by increasing acetylcholine, you can overcome that competitive antagonism. So you give neostigmine. Neostigmine can also be used in the treatment of myasthenia gravis, which we'll talk about in just another moment. Adverse effects for neostigmine it does cause generalized cholinergic, cholinergic stimulation, so all those dumbbell symptoms, salivation, flushing, decreased blood pressure, nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and so forth. Let's talk about demercarium. Demercarium is another cholinesterase inhibitor that's used to treat glaucoma. Um, it's usually used to treat chronic open-angle glaucoma, primarily in patients who are refractory to other drugs, so this is not usually a first-line drug. Sometimes it's used to treat closed angle glaucoma after surgery on the iris or iridectomy. Um, pay attention to that. In Lepicot, they spelled iridectomy wrong. It's spelled I-R-I-D-E-C-T-O-M-Y. Demicarium can also be used to diagnose and treat a condition called accommodative esotropia, where uh, farsighted patients try to accommodate by making themselves cross-eyed. So you can diagnose that with demicarium. The, uh, the mechanism of action and the, the side effects of demicarium are very similar, very similar to neostigmine. But our next drug is edrophonium. So edrophonium is another cholinesterase inhibitor. It's going to act very similar to uh, neostigmine. It has a much, much, much shorter duration of action. It's only going to last 10 to 20 minutes. And it's used in the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. If you give too much edrophonium, you can cause cholinergic crisis. You get way too much cholinergic effect. You get very leaky everywhere, all those side effects. And you can treat overdose of edrophonium with atropine. It's a cholinergic antagonist. It will be covered in the next lecture. Now, let's review myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis is caused by antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. And the most common presentation is fatigability. The muscles become progressively weaker and weaker as you use them in, uh, with activity. And then if you rest, the strength will improve. Uh, facial muscles are especially susceptible to this in the eyes, the eyelids, the facial muscles, uh, facial expression, chewing, talking, swallowing. Sometimes uh, severe myasthenia can cause uh, difficulty with breathing or it can cause problems with limb movement. And you can actually get something called myasthenic crisis where you get rapidly progressive weakness in the respiratory muscles, or the diaphragm. Now, the most common presentation for tests, the most common presentation on your board exams, is going to be ptosis, or drooping of the eyelids, or diplopia, double vision. 
that worsens throughout the day. So you'll have a question about a patient who has a little bit of ptosis early in the morning and it gets gradually worse throughout the day. They're trying to get you to think of myasthenia gravis, so be aware of that. You can make the diagnosis of myasthenia with a Tensilon test. Tensilon is the brand name of edrophonium. So you give IV edrophonium, it's going to be very rapid acting, remember it only lasts 10 or 20 minutes, and you're going to have a rapid increase in muscle strength. Suddenly you're going to get more acetylcholine, so the muscles are going to start working again. Myasthenia gravis is associated with pathology of the thymus gland. So about 50% of patients with myasthenia gravis will have thymic hyperplasia, about 20% will have thymic atrophy, and about 15% have a thymoma, or a neoplasm of the thymus. Treatment options for myasthenia gravis include indirect agonists, cholinesterase inhibitors like edrophonium, uh, but ones that are longer acting. We'll talk about a few of these other cholinesterase inhibitors used to treat myasthenia in just a moment. Um, you can also use corticosteroids. Remember, this is a disease of too many antibodies. This is an autoimmune disease, so you can suppress the immune system with corticosteroids. You can also perform a thymectomy. You remove the thymus surgically, and that can actually help treat the myasthenia. And then finally, the, the, the fourth option for treatment is plasmapheresis. That's where you remove the patient's plasma, you filter out all those antibodies, and you put the plasma back into the patient. So the antibodies are gone and you have fewer myasthenic symptoms. So let's briefly discuss some of these other cholinesterase inhibitors that we use to treat myasthenia. One of these is peridostigmine. It's a drug that acts longer than edrophonium and slightly longer than neostigmine. Pyridostigmine lasts three to six hours, and it's usually used for chronic management of myasthenia. You can remember that pyridostigmine gets rid of myasthenia. The other drug is ambinomium. It's even longer acting. It lasts four to eight hours, and both of these drugs will have uh, cholinergic side effects similar to neostigmine. So we mentioned earlier that Alzheimer's dementia is associated with loss of cholinergic transmission in the central nervous system, specifically in the temporal lobe and other areas. So some treatments for Alzheimer's disease are actually designed to increase acetylcholine. So the drugs we're talking about here include Tacrin. That was the first of these drugs that's available. Uh, it has short half-lives. So you have to give it several times a day. It has poor bioavailability. What's wrong with giving a, an Alzheimer's patient a drug that have to take three or four times a day? Well, maybe they forget to take it, and then they're not getting much benefit. Or maybe they took it, and they forgot that they took it, so they double up on their dose, and all of a sudden they're getting increased side effects. Um, so it's pretty dangerous to give Alzheimer's patients drugs that are difficult to give. It's easier to give somebody a drug that you can just take once a day. Tacrin has a lot of cholinergic adverse effects. It's also potentially hepatotoxic. That is, it causes toxicity to the liver. So use of tacrin is pretty limited. I've never seen it used clinically. It's largely been replaced by these other drugs. One of them the, I'm sure you've heard of is donepezil or Aricept. There's rivastigmine. Again, that's a stigmine drug, so it's easy to remember that that's a cholinesterase inhibitor, and another drug called galantamine. Now, all these drugs are covered in more detail in the uh, discussion on uh, Chapter 8, which is neurodegenerative diseases. All these drugs are cholinesterase inhibitors. They all increase acetylcholine, and they slow progression of Alzheimer's disease, but they can't stop progression, and they can't reverse Alzheimer's disease. You can't restore memory that's already been lost. And the adverse effects, uh, they can all cause some cholinergic side effects. Uh, typically, they cause a lot of GI side effects, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, that sort of thing. So all of the cholinesterase inhibitors we've talked about so far are reversible. Physostigmine, neostigmine, edrophonium, demicarium, Denepazil, all these are reversible um, cholinesterase inhibitors. We're now going to talk about irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors. Now, mostly we're talking about organophosphates. Organophosphates are chemicals that can bind covalently to acetylcholinesterase, so they bind to the, the enzyme, and it causes a long-lasting increase in acetylcholine. Um, many of these drugs are extremely toxic, and they were developed by the military as nerve agents, or what we used to call nerve gas. Now, these aren't gases, they're liquids at room temperature, so they're now called nerve agents, but you've probably heard of nerve gas. There are some related compounds, some other organophosphates, such as parathion and malathion, that are used as insecticides and pesticides. Malathion is sometimes used to treat lice or pediculosis, and it's also used to treat scabies. But there's a drug called ecothiophate, 
that is another organophosphate, so it covalently binds to acetylcholine esterase, and it permanently inactivates the enzyme. You have to wait until new acetylcholine esterase enzymes are produced to overcome the effect of ecothiophate. Um, it causes generalized cholinergic stimulation and paralysis of motor function, so it can cause some breathing problems. It can also cause convulsions or seizures. It's very long-acting. It lasts about a week. Remember, you can, it's, it's, a, it's irreversibly um, affecting the acetylcholine esterase enzyme, so it's going to last a long time. You can remember that uh, echothiophate sounds like echo, and echo, echo, echo is going to last a long time for it to wear off. So therapeutically, we use echothiophate uh, as an ophthalmic solution, an eye drop, for the chronic treatment of open-angle glaucoma. It's not usually a first-line treatment for glaucoma. Um, it does potentially cause an increased risk of cataracts, so, and that may limit the use of echothiophate. One last topic is organophosphate poisoning. Now, whether or not you actually ever see a case of organophosphate poisoning is going to depend on where you practice and what your specialty is and what kind of patients you're seeing and that sort of thing. But I can guarantee you'll see a question or two of, uh, over organophosphate poisoning at some point on a test, on your boards. It's a very popular board question. It always shows up. They like to test on this. So you need to be aware of how these patients present and also um, how you treat these patients. So usually in the presentation, they'll give you some kind of clue. They'll say that the patient is a gardener or the patient's been working in his or her yard. And they'll usually give you cholinergic side effects. They'll give you those, those dumbbells uh, symptoms we talked about. So if you see a gardener who's coming in with diarrhea and nausea and tearing and sweating, think organophosphate poisoning. And then how do we treat organophosphate poisoning? First of all, the chemical can be absorbed through your skin, so you need to protect yourself. You need to put on gown and gloves so you're not touching the patient and the patient's clothes and, get, and absorbing the drug yourself and getting sick yourself. Second, that chemical can be on the patient's skin and clothes, so you need to strip off the patient's clothing, rinse the patient thoroughly, get all the excess traces of the, the drug away. The two drugs we use to treat organophosphate poisoning include atropine, which we've already mentioned a couple times. That's one of the anticholinergic drugs that will be covered in the next lecture. Uh, High-dose atropine can reverse the muscarinic side effects of uh, organophos organophosphate poisoning. It can reverse all those parasympathetic effects. It can also reverse some of the CNS effects of organophosphate poisoning, including seizures and convulsions. And then the other drug we often use is pralidoxime. Now this is a drug that reactivates inhibited acetylcholinesterase if you give it soon enough. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute, I thought you said that these were irreversible uh, antagonists of acetylcholinesterase. Well, they are irreversible eventually. When the organophosphate comes in, it inactivates acetylcholinesterase, then over time the chemical composition changes, we call that aging, and as that aging process occurs, it, it goes on to be a permanent inactivation of the enzyme. Uh, if you give pralidoxime early enough, before that aging occurs, the pralidoxine will actually bind to the organophosphate and remove it from the acetylcholinesterase enzyme, and so the acetylcholinesterase is regenerated, as we say. Now, pralidoxine does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it's only going to affect the peripheral acetylcholinesterase. Um, there are some newer nerve agents that produce very rapid aging. It, the, the aging process can happen in just a few seconds, and so pralidoxine is less effective on these agents. Prelidoxime itself is a weak cholinesterase inhibitor, so at high doses, it may cause some cholinergic side effects. So, summarize, to treat organophosphate poisoning, you're going to gown and glove yourself, you're going to rinse uh, the patient's skin, strip the patient's clothes and rinse the skin, and then finally, you're going to give atropine plus prelidoxine. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. How you doing? I'm Jimmy Snake Eyes, and I got a very important question for you. Which cholinesterase inhibitor is used to make the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis? Hey, that's right, edrophonium. Look at you saying the right answers and everything. All right, here's another one. Which cholinesterase inhibitor is used to treat myasthenia gravis? Right again, peridostigmine, which gets rid of myasthenia. 
You can also use steroids and immunosuppressants. And what surgical procedure is sometimes helpful? Thymectomy. Because most patients with myasthenia have some kind of thymus pathology. All right, smart guy, get out of here. Back to the books. I said beat it. Scram. Why I oughta. All right, we're back. It's time for our quick review number three. Let's get started. Physostigmine can be used as an antidote for overdoses of what drugs? So we have to think about drugs that have a lot of anticholinergic activity. So a prototype, atropine. Uh, but you also have to think about the uh, phenothiazines, neuroleptic drugs, and tricyclic antidepressants. Next question. List some actions of physostigmine. Well, you can get contraction of visceral smooth muscle, meiosis, hypotension, and bradycardia. Next question. A 35-year-old patient is about to undergo surgery. Her anesthesiologist administered a uh, ro rocuronium, uh, a neuromuscular blocking agent, uh, to temporarily paralyze the patient during surgery. Once surgery is over, what medication can you give to reverse the paralysis that was induced? Uh, well, the one we use most often is neostigmine. So you're uh, going through a lot of paralysis, you can reverse that with neostigmine. Next question, what medication is used in the treatment of myasthenia gravis and what, medications, uh, what medication is used to diagnose the disease? Well, you want to use your longer acting medications like ne uh, neostigmine, pyrotostigmine, and uh, ambinomium. If uh, you want to diagnose it, you're going to use a really fast acting uh, version and that's edrophonium. Sometimes you'll hear, hear that referred to as a tinselin test. Next question, next question, what is the antidote for edrophonium toxicity? Uh, so uh, you're having too much cholinergic activity, how do you bring it back the other direction? Atropine. Next question, Alzheimer's disease results from a decrease in acetylcholine in the CNS. What other disease also has a decrease in acetylcholine? Um, so this is another uh, debilitating disease, Huntington's disease. So remember that as being uh, an acetylcholine deficiency. Next question, what drug regenerates acetylcholinesterase if given early in organophosphate poisoning? Uh, so what medications do we generally like to give uh, in this problem? Someone comes in, they're drooling, they're having shortness of breath, uh, they're a farmer or something. Uh, well, first you're going to give them atropine, uh, and atropine can be good, but it's not regenerating acetylcholinesterase. Uh, it's just counteracting the effects. Pralidoxine is the medication that actually helps regenerate. But you have to give it early on. Remember, uh, if, if you get it, give it later on, then they are uh, irreversibly bound uh, to those organophosphates and they're not gonna react. So give, give your pralidoxine early. All right, so that's gonna conclude our quick review number three. It's now gonna be time for our, our end of session quiz. So I want you to stop the video. I want you to answer all the questions in the end of session quiz and then restart the video and we'll go over the answers together. All right, it's time for our end of session quiz. Let's get started. What effects do the following chemicals have on acetylcholine release? Um, so let's go over this. So first, increase intracellular uh, calcium. What's that gonna do to your acetylcholine release? Well, that's gonna increase it. So an influx of calcium triggers exocytosis of stored acetylcholine. Next one, increase intracellular uh, ATP. So what's gonna happen there? Well, ATP uh, is released as a co-transmitter by uh, cholinergic neurons and inhibits further acetylcholine release. So that's gonna be decrease. Botulinum toxin, so botulinum toxin blocks acetylcholine release by the cholinergic neuron, so that's gonna decrease, again, acetylcholine release. Black widow spider venom um, stimulates acetylcholine release, so that's gonna increase acetylcholine. All the st stored acetylcholine is dumped into the synaptic cleft, and that's why eventually you get to paralysis, because you don't have any left. Next question, match the following drugs with their clinical uses. So first one is post-operative ileus. What are you gonna use? Uh, it's a bethanacol. Smoking cessation, uh, we talked about this in the lecture. Uh, Varenicline is the, the medication, that's F. Sjogren syndrome, uh, you're gonna use uh, sevimiline, and that's gonna be B. Reversal of neuromuscular blockade, we talked about this in a previous uh, section, and that's gonna be neostigmine. Diagnosis of asthma, but not for treatment. That's gonna be D, methacholine. Alzheimer's disease, and that's gonna be uh, uh, domepazil, and that's C. Next question, 
what is the clinical use for the organophosphate malathion? So uh, very commonly used malathion. Uh, it's used to treat lice uh, and scabies. Though we do use other medications uh, probably more often than malathion, but be aware that that is an organophosphate. Next question. A 63-year-old black woman presents with sudden onset of pain and tearing in the right eye uh, with colored rings in her field of vision. On examination, her right eye is red, the pupil is fixed, and the globe is firm to palpation. What drug should be given for a, uh, acute management? So this is easy. This is acute angle closure uh, glaucoma. So you got this nasty red eye that, that you know, we, we even say it's firm to palpation, so you imagine all that pressure building up in the eye. Um, so this is a medical emergency. This isn't a, hey, come back tomorrow and we'll see if this gets better. This is something that's a big, big deal. So the drug of choice for acute management of, of that glaucoma, uh, acute angle closer glaucoma is uh, pilocarpine. So remember pilocarpine. Now once she's stable, um, say she has chronic open angle acute, uh, excuse me, chronic open angle glaucoma. So it's not just only an acute problem. She has a chronic problem on top of this and she needs treatment. There are, now there's lots of different drugs that can be used for that chronic management, um, including beta blockers, alpha-2 blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, prostaglandins, and even surgery. But the drugs that were discussed in this lecture for chronic management are both uh, reversible cholinesterase inhibitors. So uh, echothiophate is one, uh, and the uh, dimicarium is another one. Next question. A 30-year-old schizophrenic male now has urinary retention due to is neuroleptic, uh, what do you want to treat uh, it with? So neuroleptic drugs, especially like haloperidol, have anticholinergic side effects. Um, some of the low potency uh, neuroleptics such as uh, thioridazine uh, tend to have a more anticholinergic side effects as well. Um, but you'll find that probably most patients now are going to be on the atypical antipsychotics, um, but they still have anticholinergic effects as well. Uh, risperidone is probably the most commonly used one right now, and it has pretty high anticholinergic effects. Um, so you're still going to see that dry as a bone, bloated as a toad, um, all those uh, symptoms come back at you. So if it's really, really bad, if you have all the way to the point of urinary retention, what medication can we use? Bethanacol. Next question. If atropine is not effective in uh, the reversal of organophosphate poisoning, then which drug uh, would you consider adding on? We've answered this before. Preladoxine. Remember that regenerates um, our acetylcholinesterases, but you have to give it early, otherwise it's, it becomes a, a permanent um, binding of that, of that organophosphate. Next question. What are the three cholinesterase inhibitors commonly used in Alzheimer's disease treatment? Uh, so donepezil is one of them. Rivastigmine is another one, and uh, galantamine is another one. Now, Tacrin previously was used, but not uh, commonly used anymore. A gardener presents with shortness of breath, salivation. Uh, I, when I write a question, I prefer to put drooling, uh, but they can put salivation, that's fine. Meiosis and diarrhea. Uh, what is the diagnosis? What is the mechanism of action uh, of this condition. So this is easy. This is organophosphate poisoning. Remember, anyone who's drooling and who's a farmer is going to automatically have organophosphate poisoning on a question. Um, and organophosphate inhibit acetylcholinesterases, so you have excess acetylcholine. Next question. A 52-year-old man presents with a complaint of muscle weakness and double vision that gets progressively worse throughout the day. What drug is used to confirm the diagnosis and what drug uh, is used for chronic management. So this is an important uh, distinction here, especially if we see uh, muscle weakness and double vision that worsens throughout the day. So this is going to make you think myasthenia gravis. So how would you confirm the test? Well, by performing the uh, Tinsilon test, and uh, that's the uh, brand name, but it's Edrophonium. It can be very, very dramatic. One of my most uh, memorable moments in medical school is watching one of these tests being done, and we had a patient who had severe myasthenia gravis, could, could barely move couldn't speak, barely open eyes, couldn't do anything, gave him the edrophonium and pop, sat straight up in bed and started just talking, talking, talking. Oh my God, this is the most amazing thing ever. Uh, you've saved me. And it was, it was awesome. It was really cool. Uh, but then we had to tell her that the medicine was going to wear off and then she got really depressed. But then we told her, don't worry, we'll give you medicine that'll help you in the long run. So, um, so what is that medicine we're going to use for the long run? Well, um, the drug for chronic management is going to be your uh, uh, pyridostigmine and it has a much longer acting uh, action. Next question. Match the agents below with the mechanism of action. So uh, echothiophate is going to be a irreversible cholinesterase inhibitor. Tacrin is a reversible. 
Uh, uh, Praladoxime is a reactivation of acetylcholinesterases. Uh, pilocarpine, direct cholinergic agonist. Galantamine is a reversible cholinesterase inhibitor. Bethanicol, direct cholinergic agonist. Dolnepazil is a reversible cholinesterase inhibitor. Rivastigmine is going to be a reversible cholinesterase inhibitor. Uh, Savimiline is going to be a direct cholinergic agonist. And edrophonium is a reversible cholinesterase inhibitor. So lots of uh, names of medications. Uh, go through this a couple different times. Get familiar with the names because they are a, a little hard to pronounce and remember. But that's going to end our end of session quiz. I hope you learned a little something. Good luck studying, and that's going to be the end of our lecture.